in total. So we, we thought this was appropriate, and I think this reflects the best practices within policing these days. The next issue that we really tackled, and, and again, <laughs> we, we were way ahead of the curve on this. We, we started thinking about this in 2015, 2016, was de-escalization. We, we really wanted to make that one of our priorities within the police department. So we instituted a department-wide uh, de-escalation training program. And we, we put this across every aspect of our training. Uh, so it was kind of like the umbrella of what we taught in every aspect of what we do. So we introduced it into our use of force and firearms training. And we did this uh, through uh, a program called simunitions training. Uh, one, one thing that I will say is that the chief uh, believes in training, and he takes training very seriously. And he, he sent uh, a few of our officers to specialized training programs in, uh, in uh, academies in New York State and outside of the state as well to learn how to uh, present these types of ideas in, in training scenarios that were as realistic as possible. We sent uh, officers to, to scenario-based training, learning how to play the characters, so, so as we call them, in, in these situations where, where they can give other officers real-life scenarios that they have to go through in, in a moment's time. So part of that is simunitions, where we use, uh, we use our actual uh, firearms, but the firearms shoot paint, paintballs, basically. And it allows our officers to really experience uh, the adrenaline rush and, and all of the auditory and, and uh, you know, verbal and all these responses uh, in a situation that is highly stressful and is as close to mimicking real world as possible. Chris, so can, it, I, can I uh, jump in here for one second? Absolutely, Chief. Go okay, ahead. good. I just wanted to make sure you could all hear me. Um, you know, Chris is spot on with everything he's saying. Um, <clears throat> two of the two of the sergeants that we had uh, that went to this training are now New York State certified domestic uh, violence trainers that are also mental health trainers. So having that certification is is really a, a major step uh, in in what Chris is explaining here, because it gave them the credentials and the training to be able to train all the members of this police department in best practices which is, you know, we were so forward thinking with this that well, be, well before uh, any of the things that are going on in this country have came to the, to the forefront of everybody's TV set. We've been doing this now for the last five years. So I'm pretty proud of that. In addition to that, Chris and I, as a deputy chief and myself, are New York State certified uh, general topic instructors. We can go any place within New York State and teach at any police academy, basically, uh, any time that we feel the need to, uh, which is also like a, a like a really big thing that we have in this police department. We don't rely on uh, finding training from other agencies, like a lot of agencies do, because then you're at their beck and call. You know, a lot of the training that, that our officers get here are in-house taught, which is which is huge. And I'd like to commend uh, Deputy Chief Ortiz for staying on top of this and for getting getting our members uh, in training positions the best training that they can possibly have. So Chris, uh, without uh, stealing the show here, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, so as, as the chief said, we, we really put uh, a lot of emphasis on, on training and, and getting the best information and, and programs to our officers. So in, in, in with that, is as the chief mentioned, uh, we also did uh, uh, training on dealing with mental and emotional crisis. And again, the whole umbrella of this, this training was de-escalation, bringing a situation from crisis back down into uh, uh, normality, slowing it down, taking the time to deal with people and getting a positive resolution. And all of this training we, we rolled out to every single officer and again, we did this back in 2016. And as a sidebar, since we did that training, we actually have seen use of force 
and, and issues like that decrease within the department. The next topic that I wanted to get into is, is less lethal force. The Glencoe Police Department was one of the early adopters on the use of TASER. We've had TASER, I believe, since uh, 2007. It's, it's been here for a very long time. Uh, in contrast, Nassau County, I believe, even, just got Even it. earlier, Chris, we've had it since uh, 2005. 2005, and Nassau County has had it only for a year or two, Chief? Yes. Uh, yeah. We adopted it, actually, after we had an event in, <clears throat> across the street from the police station. Uh, where, where the old village square was, we had a uh, mentally disturbed person who lived in 2131 Brewster Street uh, take a samurai sword, okay, took almost all his clothes off and uh, went into village square, into the main, uh, uh, the main center of the village square itself and started threatening to kill people with that samurai sword. So officers responded and um, basically were able to, and they would have been justified in using deadly physical force, with no doubt in, in my mind, uh, given all the circumstances uh, I'm not going to get into here right now, it's lengthy, but he did actually uh, advance towards our officers in a menacing way with that samurai sword. They would have been justified in, in using deadly physical force to end that scenario. However, they backed up and talked and talked and talked and de-escalated the situation uh, and finally got the guy to put the sword down and we were able to take him into custody and, and get him the help that he needed because uh, he was in mental crisis. So uh, as an after action uh, uh, meeting on that event, um, the topic of taser came up and should we get it, shouldn't we get it? Uh, that, was, that was the uh, final straw uh, for us to make the decision to, to uh, uh, procure these, these devices. And since we've gotten them, they've been a wonderful tool for us. Uh, Chris can get into the statistics, but uh, we we very rarely actually deploy them with a, with a taser shot. I think it might be somewhere around once or twice a year, and some years we haven't used it at all. Uh, however, we have uh, uh, told people that we would use it if they didn't comply. And that uh, was enough in many, many, many situations to get people to, uh, to give up, and not, not people that were in a mental crisis, but other people that maybe wanted to challenge us and, 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 and you know, not uh, get into a set of handcuffs in a peaceful way, because uh, many times people don't want to give up their freedom. And a, a lot of what we do is, is talking to people and talking them into the handcuffs, because uh, at the end of the day, this way, you know, their safety is our primary uh, is our primary goal as well as our own. So uh, I was told early on when I was in the police academy and it's something that stayed with me until this day and I still believe in it, like I believe in uh, the air we breathe, is the best police officers are the best communicators. And time and again, I can give you example after example after example of talking people out of crisis, okay, into uh, either a set of handcuffs because they made a mistake and committed a crime or uh, into going to a treatment facility because they have a mental health crisis and they need help. So uh, that was the reason that we actually got the tasers, uh, that samurai sword incident, and uh, so glad that we actually have them. We have enough for each officer to, uh, while on patrol, uh, take one if they so choose, um, and most do decide to take them. We don't have enough to give to every officer because they're expensive, but we have enough for every officer on patrol to have one. And Chris can get into the bowl around. That's something uh, new that we just uh, we got to the department. Chris, do you want to explain on that? Sure. So, so as I was saying, let's leave the force. We we were the early adopters on this. So Taser came, uh, as the chief said, 2005. We were one of the first uh, uh, organizations here in, in Nassau County to issue those Tasers to our officers. Uh, you know. The latest statistics that we collect is uh, we use Taser about twice per year. Uh, 2018, we didn't use it at all. So, so it varies, but it's it's very rarely used. Uh, it, it, and in total, use of force in the Glencoe Police Department is a pretty rare event as well. Now, the Bola Wrap, that's a brand new technology. Uh, we are the first agency on Long Island to have the Bola Wrap, and uh, it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty like uh, uh, science fiction type stuff. So if, if you can think about uh, uh, 
Batman with his web. The bowler wrap is a, a similar type of device. It, it ejects uh, a, a string, and the string comes out with such a force that it's able to wrap around the arms or the legs of the individual that we're trying to, uh, to contain and basically make them so they can't strike you or kick you or run away. And again, there's no injury involved. It's, it's less lethal, and it's something that is brand new. And we wanted to give our officers an option of having these. We, we purchased 10 of them so that every officer can bring one out on patrol. And if they get into a situation where a person wants to fight them or do anything uh, such as that, they can keep distance and deploy the bowler wrap and defuse the situation. Again, both of these tools are all about de-escalation. De we want to bring a situation down and resolve it without violence or force. All right, the uh, last part I wanted to get into is fair and respectful policing. Uh, if you could see on the left-hand side of the slide is our policy on racial profiling, bias-based policing. And it's a pretty lengthy policy. Again, this is uh, PS-2-20, this is from last year, our policy, but it's the second thing that is in our policies and procedures because it, to highlight its importance, it is the umbrella of how we do business. And if you look at the bottom left on that uh, date issued, you can see that it was issued January 1st of 2015. We've been doing, uh, we've been outlawing this type of uh, policing in our agency for a very long time, and it's actually been before that that we've taken a stance on this. But 2015 is the first time we revamped uh, all of our policies, so that's the new policy guideline. Uh, and I'll just read from from the policy. It is the policy of the Glencoe Police Department to prohibit all police practices involving profiling or other bias-based decisions. No officer may take any enforcement actions based solely upon any common trait shared by any group of people, which is not in itself indicative of criminal activity. This includes but is not limited to race, ethnic background, gender, sexual orientation, religion, economic status, age, cultural group, or any other group identifier. The Glencoe Police Department does not condone racial profiling, bias-based policing, and members of this department will not engage in it. Very important policy for us. Uh, it's something, again, that, that directs everything we do and how we do business and how the community uh, receives police services from us. Finally, uh, I wanted to go over eight can't wait. This was something that was brought up at a, uh, a meeting we had. Uh, the mayor hosted a, a town hall meeting on policing, and uh, uh, I believe it was uh, Reverend Williams brought this up, uh, the idea of eight can't wait. And I, I hadn't heard of this, so I did some research on it, and, and it really is a, a great idea. These are eight recommendations that police departments should undertake to, to improve their practices. And the first one is uh, obviously ban chokeholds and strangleholds. And you can see, uh, as we outlined, we, we did this uh, across the board where there are no chokeholds used in the Glencoe Police Department. And surprisingly, only about 25 to 27 percent of police agencies across the country do this. I was surprised at that. Uh, require de-escalation. This was this is our our umbrella policy of the Glencoe Police Department. Uh, we've been doing this since 2016, and uh, only about 48 percent of police departments are doing this across the country. Require warning before shooting. We've done this since I was in the police academy 24 years ago. Uh, uh, 70 percent of police departments do that, and and we certainly do. Uh, require to exhaust all altern alternatives before shooting. We require that in our use of force policy. Only about 40% of police departments across the country require that. Duty to intervene. That means if you see an uh, officer uh, doing something they shouldn't, you, you have a duty, an affirmative duty, to get in there and stop that situation. Or if, uh, if somebody, if you use force, you, you have a duty to uh, now aid that person as well. So it goes both ways. Uh, only about 50% of police departments do that. 
we've been doing that again since I've been in the police academy. Ban shooting at moving vehicles. Uh, only about 20% of police departments actually do this. We've been doing this for 24 years, I'm sure, even before I was here, we've been doing that. Require a use of force continuum. As part of our, our use of force training, we have a use of force continuum, and part of that use of force continuum, as you saw earlier, is de-escalation. That's, that's a big part of our use of force continuum. Uh, again, about 80% of police departments do that, and we've been doing that since I became a police officer. Require comprehensive reporting of force. Uh, we started collecting all of our data and, and all of the information regarding when officers use force probably about three or four years ago. Again, that was an outgrowth of, uh, of when uh, uh, of a, a training program that the chief went to, and he came back and said, hey, we got to do this, and, and we put uh, pen to paper and, and created a policy and a procedure to do that. Only about 30% of police departments across the country do that. So I think this is an excellent way to end and, and frame the conversation. These are the eight things that, that advocates are saying police departments need to do, and these are the eight things that we've been doing at least for two years or more. So. Uh, you know, in, in reality, we're, we're ahead of the game, and we've, we've tried to uh, make sure that all officers have uh, the, the best tactics, the best training, and the best tools at hand so that they can provide uh, the, the people of Glen Cove the best police services possible. Uh, that is our goal, and, and it's something that uh, – we're always striving to, to capitalize on, work on, achieve, and it, it's, it's our, our, uh, our ending desire. It's something that, that we really take to heart. Uh, I, you know, and I think you could see that in, in our, our uh, department motto at the bottom of the screen, committed to excellence, and, and that's something we uh, put out many years ago, and, and it's, we're committed to excellence in everything we do, whether it's training, whether it's uh, – uh, helping somebody with directions or helping somebody with a flat tire or dealing with somebody in crisis. We try to be the best that we can be and help that person to the greatest extent possible. Uh, Chief, you have anything to add before I close out? Um, one, one of the members of this meeting has asked me uh, privately if uh, you would mind if I demonstrated the ball wrap on you. <laughs> so. uh, I think Spiro would like to have the bowler wrap and the taser demonstrated on you. <laughs> no, I would no. Come on now, never. <laughs> By the way, so, uh, uh, it, you know, I'm going to order uh, that we should have it uh, be seen. Travis. I want to see it in in person. So I motion <laughs> that we uh, have this uh, procedure done. Uh, I'm looking for a second. <laughs> order. order. <laughs> no, uh, Chris, you did a great you did a great job, and you know I. I can't say enough uh, great things about Chris Ortiz and what he brings to the table here for this organization. He's constantly uh, on top of things. Um, you know, Chris <clears throat> Chris has his PhD. He won't blow his horn, so I'll do it. Uh, he, he, he's, he's in contact with uh, academians in the policing world from, from here uh, across country to California and every place in between where we're constantly looking here to better ourselves and, and looking for best practices and, and areas that we can improve. But I, I, I have to say without like, <clears throat> without being overly confident that we're ahead of the game uh, compared to almost every police agency that, uh, yes. that I've uh, been yes. witness to, uh, exposed to, going through training. Uh, we, yes. we are so much uh, more advanced <laughs> In the way we get things um, done here with this department than many police departments across the country. And I think that that's the reason that, reason that we have a dearth of complaints against us and lawsuits and some of the other things that you see going on across the country. Um, I, I can't speak for what they do in Arkansas or some of these other places, but I can tell you that annually, Chris and I go to training uh, given by the IHCP, International Association of Chiefs of Police. And, you know, some, some departments do it really, really, really well. Uh, we're not the only one. There's a lot of departments that don't, and they have what's called negligent intentions. So you wonder why a guy like uh, Officer Shavin 
would, uh, would be able to uh, exist on that police department for 19 years and have all the complaints that he had against him and still not stay on that job. That's my bottom line to me. If we, had any, if we had an officer like that here, they would be dismissed from this police department. There's no way in the world we would keep somebody like that. But yet in that agency, for whatever reason, they kept him. They kept him for 19 years and he had, you know, close to 20 complaints of excessive force ending in what we all watched on TV and, and, and started this whole uh, tremendous movement going across the country uh, about police brutality and other things. I'm proud to say that in this agency, we don't have those issues, uh, but I don't pretend that they don't exist in other places. They do. Uh, the unfortunate thing is a lot of police agencies get painted with a broad brush uh, that, that, that there's a systemic uh, movement in, in the police department across the country that these types of things happen, but I can promise you that they don't. And, and it's uncommon and it's unfortunate, but yet we all have to pay the price and, and explain ourselves. But in a way, I guess uh, from the bad comes some good because it's gonna modify some of these other police departments behavior and get them in line with where they should be. And it also gives us in this police department uh, an opportunity to showcase everything that we, I think we're doing right, which is I think almost everything. Now we can all improve. Everybody, you know, I'm sure that, you know, if, if, if Bill Bratton came into the police department, he could probably find some things that would be difficult. But I think for the most part, we're doing it right, Chris, and everybody else is listening. All right, that, that concludes what we wanted to say. Thank you, everyone, for uh, your, your attention. And uh, I'm sure you'll be hearing more about this as the weeks roll out. Uh, there will be some public discussion on this, and, uh, and hopefully, uh, We'll, we'll get to a, a, a good spot together as a community. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. I just want to say on behalf of the Youth Bureau, um, we've had a relationship with the police department whew, forever uh, between mentoring, between uh, now that I'm more familiar with the, the sports programs, coaching and being on all sorts of committees and being involved on our boards. I just want to say thank you. You guys literally just rock you're amazing anything we ever need we just phone call and you're there so i just want to say thank you i feel everyone feels the same way christine everybody Absolutely. just want to say thank you and thank you for this presentation today thank you very much i, I have um, 60 seconds just thank i mean from what you guys have done for, for the senior center, I know for forever, but just the year that I've been here, um, we know 100% that no matter what, uh, you know, we call you and you're there. And the fact that you just step over and check in and make sure all our seniors are okay is just thank you so much from all of us. And they're the entertaining group at our fundraiser too. So you can always go, can't go wrong. Um, I believe some people just came in. I don't know if you want to introduce yourselves. I Anne, I think you might have just popped in. You weren't here before, right? No, I just joined. How's everybody? Hey, Anne. Anne Simon, director of the CDA and IDA. Thank you, Anne. Did I miss anyone else? Perfect. No, no I have to leave Spiro, but before I do, since I just unmuted myself. Where are you? Okay. I just wanted to, before I go, I just wanted to thank uh, DC Ortiz and Chief Witten. Um, the SAFE Agency has had a collaborative relationship with the police for over 30 years doing um, community prevention education and Deputy Chief's um, wonderful presentation was shared with Mrs. Caballero's uh, parent group over the summer and it made quite a difference in um, feelings and perceptions of police during a time when there was a heightened awareness and fear. Um, so I want to thank the police department for taking their time to educate a lot of our parents in the community that have assimilated and not acculturated and were extremely fearful of um, policing in general. So I'd like to thank you, uh, Chief Ortiz and uh, Chief Witten for working with SAFE and always being available to educate our parents and our youth regarding any issues that happen to come up through our outreach. Well, like, likewise, Sharon, you, you've always given us a, an opportunity and, and a great platform to uh, communicate with a, a broad spectrum of, of the community. 
and uh, we we certainly do appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Okay, uh, Kathy, you're up. You're muted. Still muted. Still muted. That's Maybe. that's the, uh, the 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 biggest phrase of 2020. As a, uh, you're, you're muted. muted. <laughs> you're <laughs> muted. Um, I act, thank you for um, giving us this spotlight. So I'm not really going to take too long. I'll just introduce Bridget. Bridget is um, our patient navigator, and it's a, a relatively new program for the two facilities. Um, and she's going to talk to you guys about that program and some other support groups that we offer to the community. So I'm going to just let Bridget take it from here. Bridget, you're muted. <laughs> Still muted. There you, there you go. go. There you go. Okay. So uh, thanks for the opportunity, Kath. Thanks for your help with all of this. Um, this is my first Zoomy, guys. So uh, give me some <laughs> uh, Zoom technology uh, support here. So I want to just first um, thank thank the IAC. I've known of you guys for a long time, being a lifelong Glen Cove resident. Um, and I want to kind of preface my role as the patient navigator uh, by describing to you some of my experience in the healthcare, specifically the skilled nursing facilities, um, which are pretty prominent in today's news, both good and bad. Um, I did serve as admissions director for Glen Cove Center for 12 years and was looking for a way out because that position usually has a shelf life of seven. I doubled it just about. So um, they did create for uh, the a few a few of the uh, the organization's buildings what Kathy is calling the patient navigator, and I first want to make clear I'm not taking anybody to the Starship Enterprise. They are just gonna be <laughs> safe where they're old. Although maybe people want to jump on that spaceship. So having that experience as an admissions director. You know, I really know all the ins and outs of, you know, what goes on in a skilled nursing facility. Um, and there is the good, the bad, and the ugly. Nobody wants to go from hospital into another facility. All the transitions are dramatic. Many, many family members just, what am I getting into? What is my loved one getting into? And this is all before the pandemic. So we are now in a whole different, um, a whole different state of mind and operation and protocol. Uh, I'm just recognizing a lot of people on the board here. Um, you know, hi everybody who I know. Uh, I know a lot of people have had the experience of going from hospital to skilled nursing facility. So what we're lacking today because of the pandemic and it hits deeply in the lives of all of us is the isolation that's occurring again. You know, we had that brief period, you know, you know, late summer into early spring, I mean, into early fall, where families were being able to visit, you know, really maybe not in person, but, you know, facilities were setting up, you know, booths and vestibules where they could at least eye on their loved ones. And that is now on great hold throughout all facilities, unfortunately. So the, the, the isolation on so many levels is devastating. Families can't see their loved one. We can all identify with this. Um, patients die without seeing their loved ones. Uh, patients have very limited access many times through you know, FaceTiming or you know, a Zoom conference, for example, but it's really not enough. So the role of the navigator really originates when that patient is admitted into the skilled nursing facility. So I represent Glen Cove, Emerge, and I also have inherited another building um, in, in Woodbury. And the goal is to really to lead the family through the next steps, you know, kind of getting familiar with their needs, the patient's needs, and being an extra voice and an extra hand to hold because many times the facilities are so overrun with, with things that just have to be immediately taken care of that phone call conversations aren't happening as they should. So the navigator's role is to kind of like, like I said, walk people through the next steps, which leads us to their discharge home. So the primary goal of the patient navigator is to prevent a further hospitalization. When the patient goes home, and I hear this time and time and time again, 
when I speak to family members, and it's really all about our family members and our patients, they'll say to me, um, you know, like um, I, I was so happy that mom's coming home and now the anxiety level is like off the charts because there's always that unanticipated, is mom gonna fall? What if she falls? Or unfortunately, a lot of times the patient is not discharged you know, with the appropriate medications or, you know, things aren't in place that are absolutes to ensure that that patient is returning home safely. So part of the role of the navigator is to check in on that family. And I often do it way before the discharge, just so I can prepare, like, what are some of your fears about taking mom home? I know you're really happy, but you're probably also scared she might fall. So we go over certain particulars um, just to really just to reach out and connect all of those, those humane dots that have been removed from lives, most specifically, you know, when the patient's in a closed door room, I mean, staff is fully garbed. I, when I used to be able to go in and visit my patients who have known many of them for many, many years, many Glencoe families, and I'm, I'm souped, you know, I'm suited up head to toe and they know, they only know my nasally voice. It's the only way they can recognize me because it's nothing like they're familiar with. And as we're going deeper into this second wave, um, even our most alert patients are really suffering from uh, the isolation and separation. So upon discharge, we try to, let me check my notes. What we try to do is form a team which includes the family's primary care physician, whom we reach out to, you know, whoever the primary caregiver to the patient is. And if the patient is alert and oriented, of course, that person becomes the representative for themselves and the facility. To work as a team when the patient arrives home to monitor and mitigate, you know, any difficulty that might present, you know, a threat or jeopardize the safety of that patient returning home. So, I mean, these are important things and um, we're hoping just to alleviate, alleviate some of the anxiety and the sense of isolation. I mean, part of what I have to do is, unfortunately on a daily basis, when I call families from home, I do hear the things like the medication was wrong or, you know, mom already fell out of bed. And so we work to how can we prevent this from happening again? Um, so, so steps are taken, we stay involved. Uh, if problems need to be solved, we are the one that gets it done. So we can help with that. It gives the family a sense of confidence. So to Kathy's point earlier, and to Kathy, at Kathy's credit, and also our director of, um, she changed her title at, on me at the last minute. So she, her name is Lisa Penzenier, and she is the director of the um, support programs that are being developed by Paragon, who is our company, our, our, our organization. Um, the support groups I'm gonna describe briefly um, are three, and they are, they are unique support groups in that they work in conjunction with the nav navigation program. Each of these programs are free of charge and are basically available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's with, with the help of our community liaisons, the patient navigators and, you know, social work at the, at, at the facilities as well. So they, um, excuse me, and they are, they're offered island wide. You don't have to be a patient at any one of the skilled nursing facilities to take advantage of, the, of these programs. So the goal is to prevent, present invitation, information on preventive measures, which can eliminate or greatly reduce the risk of rehospitalization, as I mentioned other, you know, other time. Some of the measures may include confirming that initial appointments with the primary uh, care physician have been made, that medications are being taken according to discharge instructions and home care and PT visits have been scheduled. These are critical, these are fundamental things that are going to ensure the patient staying safely at home. You know, the, the threat of rehospitalization is everybody's nightmare. It's the hospital. The hospital is going to point fingers at the skilled nursing facility. If the patient comes from the home, why didn't you educate that patient to prevent that fall? So, and plus, there is a financial piece to this because everybody gets penalized, especially if 
a, pa a patient is hospitalized within 30 days of a last admission. Another important thing for us to check in on is that we um, see how the family's doing. How is the patient doing? Simple things. Is the patient eating and sleeping well? Um, is, is he in any distress? And truly, you know, we make the phone call between a day to two days after discharge. And yeah, they could be, um, you know, they could be not sleeping well or eating well or having anxiety. So we're there to address those things. Okay, and we also check in on the family because oftentimes the patient is returning home to an aging spouse who also may have issues that need to be considered. Support groups. We have the Glen Cove Pulmonary Support Group, which partners with the Better Breathers Club and the American Lung Association. It offers monthly online meetings that is moderated by a pulmonary specialist who's been trained by the AL, uh, ALA, the American Lung Association. The members practice therapies learned during their rehab stay and discuss current issues and concerns. And in some cases, they're learning new therapy protocols. Um, all of these, uh, these support programs are available through Zoom. And if the patient or the person interested is unfamiliar with Zoom, hello. Um, they are also, they can be put in contact with a personal um, professional with regard to that group. The second uh, support group that we have in place, and it really ties into the pulmonary program because this group is called the Post COVID-19 Support Group for Survivors. And it's the only one of its kind in Nassau County. It meets to discuss positive means of reaching goals to move forward in life. Um, it includes, it also includes facing mental, phys physical and mental challenges such as pulmonary disorders, fatigue, anxiety, and depression in the aftermath of the virus. And there are currently three large active groups in, um, in place. And because of the blessings of Zoom, which I'm just learning about, uh, this spans the Northeast, the North, Northeast states. I mean, we have people come, actually, Lisa has one person who is from California. There's no boundary to this and it affects everybody. Uh, again, free of charge. And Kathy's gonna post all of the contact information um, to your website, so it's available. The third and last is called our amputee support group, which provides guidance for the patient upon returning home and also offers assistance, ensuring that the patient is getting the necessities such as food, medications, and transportation. Um, I can say from a personal point of view, in the time that I was at Glen Cove Center as administration uh, admissions uh, director, I really didn't realize how many you know, people out there are ampute amputees. I think a lot of us think amputation veteran. You know, they're not somebody who has a diabetic, you know, relationship to that necessary procedure. It's a big audience. And we, you know, had in the 12 years I were there, I, I, I want to say 15 to 20 patients that were amputees and their life is fraught with difficulties. Um, and that includes our veterans, our honor veterans who, I mean, I think Kathy's program did uh, when they, we, they know we no longer could have, um, you know, meetings, you know, you know, uh, protocol following meetings in person that they dropped off. Kath, was it like Veterans Day this past year? And I think Kathy had, they distributed between Kathy and Mary Siddell, our other liaison, like some 95 to 95. It was something like that. Yeah. And oh, I mean, upwards of that. Yeah, it was around there. Which I mean, to the door, like drop offs to the upwards, door. Yes. Yeah. Which, I mean, you know, in a, in a sales perspective, if you get, you know, out of 500 calls, you get 5% return on that. That's, that's average for really pretty darn good. I think Kath told me that she got something over 12 calls, personal calls from these veterans. And I mean, so this, 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 uh, this, this program also offers a way um, for all of our people. And, and I want to give a, like a point out to the veterans, especially they're, they're dying to have someone to talk to and socialize with, and they have things in common to discuss. So it's there for them as well. So as I said, again, um, the information, how to contact these groups and the navigation program, which is really a soup to nuts experience from the patient's entry into skilled nursing 
to leaving the skilled nursing facility and onward from that can be seen, will be posted on your website. So I thank you for the opportunity. Anybody have a quick question? I'm open to it. Hey, Bridget, too. Um, guys, this program, this patient navigation program is very unique. There are not, I don't believe there are any other facilities that offer this. So it's good for, if you guys know of anyone who needs rehab, this is a, a service that is not offered at every subacute skilled nursing facility. So it's just something to keep in mind. It's, a, it's groundbreaking and we're hoping to take this wider to most of our buildings, right, Bridget? Like this Absolutely. is something. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is it's kind really of a necessary. Program. It is Yeah, necessary. and it's, it's an amazing program and we thought it would be important to share that knowledge with all of you guys in the community so that in the event that you know of anyone that needs our services, you know the services that we offer in the facility and then upon discharge um, and all these support services. And you don't even have to have come through our facility to benefit Correct. from these support services. So I'll send the flyers in to, um, to Jamea and Carolyn, I guess, and uh, we could post them on the website and maybe circulate them to our membership because the, um, the Better Breathers meets the third Thursday of every month. Um, the post-COVID group, meets three times a month, but they haven't set the dates for this month. And the amputees meet on the second Wednesday of the month. So um, there's a, a lot of opportunity for people in the community to find support for the conditions that they're living with. So thank you, Bridget, for taking the time um, to share the program and the support groups with our membership. I appreciate it. And thanks, Spiro, for letting us. <laughs> yes, thank no, you, thank Spiro. you guys for presenting. Not a problem. Nice meeting you, Bridget, and thank you. I appreciate Thank you. Um, I know uh, that's it with the presenters for today. I know some of you might have uh, something to discuss as well, but uh, Maureen did send me um, a flyer that will be shared to you guys by Gabor. It's for Martin Luther. There it goes. And Carolyn will email it to everybody. That is for this year's Martin Luther King Jr. Um, commemorative uh, program. So Maureen, do you want to say anything about it or... Sure. Um, just to you know, make sure everybody uh, realizes that we won't have the um, the regular parade and uh, ceremony this year due to um, COVID, but we will be doing a terrific um, program on Zoom, and we've been working uh, hard with the committee. Um, of course, Cheryl Goodine, who always is uh, heads up that committee and does such a great job, but um, the school, the, the mayor's office, um, you know, so many different people that are involved. It's going to be a great uh, program. And um, I think everybody should just take that hour um, on Monday morning and tune in. I think you'll really enjoy it. <laughs> um, and it's, it's just a great way to commemorate the day and the man. So um, we hope that you'll all be there and that you'll spread the word. That's the biggest thing is getting the information out. We will have something in the paper. We, are, we do have um, flyers being made up. So we just need people to get the information out there so that uh, you know, everybody can, can join us. Um, and just one other very quick um, thing I wanted to mention was that a, a few weeks ago, I had mentioned about um, the mayor's office making up um, packets of masks and hand sanitizer that we're going to be distributing in the community. So we finally have the majority of them done. Um, we, on this coming Saturday, behind City Hall, between one and two o'clock, we will just have people coming in in their cars we, you know, we have like uh, La Fuerza, Nosh, um, some of the churches, um, the Boys and Girls Club, um, Senior Center, anybody that's interested in getting some packets um, to pass out to uh, people in their congregations, in their uh, organizations, whatever it may be, please feel free to come. Um, we'll be just putting in, them in the back of cars and you can take them and then distribute them. But we think it's a great way of getting more masks and more hand sanitizer out there so people stay aware that this is becoming, um, not becoming, it is a, a huge issue and uh, we have a, a big uptick 
in uh, on Long Island and all over with COVID. And we hope that uh, we can get everybody to do the right thing and follow the guidelines. So we will be handing those out on Saturday. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, anyone else? Ron? Yes, um, thanks. Um, uh, I just wanted a follow up for, for Kathy and Bridget. Um, just a question. Um, my my mother-in-law um, who, who passed away early last year, um, she was 99, almost 100. Nothing to do with COVID, nothing, you know, it was just her time. And she was in a, a private apartment and so forth with uh, care. So not nursing home related or rehabilitation. But my, my question is that we have, um, things left over from her care, specifically some equipment and supplies, a, a, a hoiler lift, which is sitting unused in our basement. And I know that with COVID, there are issues about transference of stuff, but uh, it just seems like a total waste. And I wondered if, is there anything moving forward that we can play? Can we donate? Uh, I, we want to donate, we want it to be used by somebody. And- uh, Ron, I don't know that the facility can accept the equipment, the facilities, I should say, but if you go on Facebook, there are so mm -hmm. many groups of P, uh, uh, like the Generation X group. Um, Ron, if you want to call me, I'll put yeah. my number in the chat. Okay. I can give, and you can post on those groups, and you'll be surprised at the need that's out there. And someone will take those things off of your hand and use them. Okay. So I'm going to put my phone number in the chat. Give me a okay. call after this call, and we'll talk about it. Okay. okay. That's great. I appreciate yep. it. No problem. Great. Anyone else? Yes, if if I may, um, I you can uh, give the treasury report first. Yes, sir. Um, we already have three paid members for this year, which is fantastic. But uh, the bad news is that they all paid double last year, so that's why they are paid this year. <laughs> um, the um, invoice went out. Uh, thank you so much, Carolyn, for sending it out to everybody. If you haven't received it, please let me know. Um, it's $100 still, uh, which is a bargain, and $200 if you don't want to pay next year. Um, uh, we had 40 members in um, 2018 and uh, 46 2019, and we dropped down to 41 because of COVID, I guess. Uh, last year, I would like us to grow, continue growing because it benefits everybody. Uh, so if you know anybody who would be uh, um, a good fit for us, please, uh, the uh, applica new member application was sent out with your invoice. So please um, forward it to them and uh, solicit them to join us so we can all benefit. Um, so that, oh, we have $8,000 in the bank, which is a segue to our next segment, which is our celebration. Uh, we were going to... Am I okay to, to talk about this, uh, Peter? Yep. Uh, we are going to do a few things. Uh, we decided at the board meeting, uh, we are going to purchase a, a full page ad uh, maybe every month in the Herald, unless uh, someone has a better idea and fill it with the celebration of our member agencies and invitation to a, an event that we're gonna do. We don't know if we're gonna call it a gala yet, but. It's going to be a big celebration. Anyway, um, we have a date, uh, October 1st of this year. Hopefully by then, we are going to have free freedom to, to congregate uh, from the virus. If not, then we'll have to reimagine it. But so far, uh, so, so at this point, we are, we are uh, uh, planning an in-person uh, celebration. We are going to honor our um, founding uh, mem founding members, and I forgot her name. I, 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 Rhoda Finer. Rhoda Finer. She's going to be our, our honoree. And um, I'm going to reach out um, to the mansion and to the Metropolitan and see if they can hold the date for us and for how much. So uh, that event and the paper uh, papers is two things that we planned, but I think we could uh, augment this with other things, ideas coming from you. So if you have ideas how to 
honor the IEC and how to celebrate our 50th anniversary, uh, please let us know and we will put it in motion. Thank you. Thank you, Gabor. Anyone else? Um, I just have a quick question. Um, I have not been receiving the um, emails for the Zoom links for our monthly meetings. A colleague of mine has been sending them over. So I'm just wondering if I put my email in the chat, if I'll be able to, I guess, join the email list. The best way to do it is to send an, an answer email to Carolyn, Carolyn Wilson. Wills Carol. Um, she, ha she had to step out. She has to leave. Yeah. So if you have it forwarded to you, you can see Carolyn Wilson's email on it, right? Mm -hmm. Send her an email, please, asking for your email to be uh, included. And she's okay. the keeper of the emails. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Um, wish everyone a happy, healthy, safe new year. Uh, we will see you guys back to our normal second Wednesday of the month uh, meetings. If anybody would like to present, uh, and Carolyn's not here, if anybody would like to present, please let me or Carolyn know. Uh, we might be looking for presenters uh, for the next couple of months. We were supposed to have Dr. Vogren. I'm not sure if he's still doing it, but um, we look forward to your presentation. So please, if there's anything you'd like to discuss, talk about your agencies, um, anything, whatever it is, please let us know. Um, so just want to say happy new year again, and we'll see you guys next month. Bye guys. Bye everyone. Bye, thank you. Happy new year, everyone. Happy new year. Happy, happy new, new year. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.